is one that you have probably heard before. You may have even already heard it at some point in this Advent Christmas season. So I invite you to hear the words from Matthew chapter two, verses one through 12, old words with fresh ears. I invite you to hear the reading of the word of God and in honor of the gospel. Let us please stand as we are able. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born and they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, you Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the sun or when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went and look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened up their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by a different route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Please be seated and let us pray. Lord, we are your people and we long to be more so. We pray that your spirit would do the work that only your spirit can in this moment, that you would continue to be our guiding light, that you would continue to point us in the direction of the Christ, and that you would continue to show us where we need to walk by a different route. In the name of the three in one, we pray, amen. Mistakes, we all make them. And at this time of year, when we are talking about resolutions, new beginnings, new things, we think about the things that we have not done the way that we want to, and we begin to imagine and to walk towards change. Oftentimes, those things that we've done that we don't want to do again, they fall into the category of either mistakes or intentionality. So let's look at a couple of ways that a little, small moment can have a vast and sometimes tragic consequence. For instance, I came across an article where someone had gone through and found 10 of the worst consequences and mistakes that interns had made at the beginning of their career. It's quite comical, actually, but the best one was number four, I believe, anonymous. Go figure, no one would want us to know his name, but he said, I was beginning my internship with a company that was in tech at the time, and it was when those laser pointers, you know the ones that you can point and the cats will chase them around? Well, it was when they were first coming out on the market, and we had gotten a couple of them in our office as a gift from some company. Well, it was late at night, it was dark outside, and me and a couple of the other interns had finished up with a section of work that we had, but there was much left to do late into the evening. And so we took a break and we took these fancy laser pointers and we started pointing them around the office. Well, there was a big window in the high rise that we worked in. And, and so we went and we pointed those laser pointers out of the window and lo and behold, you could see the little red dots on the street. What we didn't realize was that the president of the United States happened to be staying at the hotel across said street that was the first and only time the Secret Service ever came to pay me a visit, and they do not have a sense of humor. 
sometimes. We're just doing what we're doing innocently, and yet there can be consequences because of things that are happening around us that we are unaware of happening. Sometimes it is error on our part. You see, uh, back in June of 2000, there was a Millennium Bridge that was built by the Thames River in the heart of London. Engineers worked on this bridge for many, many moons and many, many months. $32 million went into the building of this fantastic, beautiful bridge. On the day that they celebrated the opening of the Millennium Bridge in June of 2000, as people were beginning to walk across, they had to shut it down because engineers had built the bridge by developing a 3D model with 2D calculations. Now, any of the engineers in the room probably understand what I'm saying, but for those of us that may not necessarily grasp all of the equations in our head like I cannot anymore. Basically, they figured out how it wobbled like this. They didn't take into the equation that it would be in space and go from side to side. Kids on a playground know that a bridge wobbles from side to side, but you get some of the smartest people together in a room and you give them a 2D model and just the smallest mathematical error cost $9 million to fix. They had to shut the bridge down and reopen it months later because of synchronous lateral excitation. That's the fancy word for oops. You know, sometimes mathematical errors cost us a lot of money, but sometimes just a degree, just a degree can have consequences as well. You know, any pilot can tell you that if you want to circumnavigate the globe, if your instrumentation is off by a degree, your, your airplane is just going off course by one degree all the way around the globe. By the time you get back to the same longitude, you're 500 miles off. One small degree, we can't even create it with our fingers, it can take us miles from the destination that we intended to arrive at. And sometimes it can have devastating consequences. Like in 1979, there was a large passenger jet with 257 people on board. It left New Zealand for a sightseeing flight in Antarctica, but the, the instrumentation had been worked on and it was off by just one or two degrees. From New Zealand to Antarctica, as the pilots were beginning their descent into what they believed was going to be the point of landing, they were actually 28 miles away from where they should have been. And because the snow and the clouds and everything looked the same and they'd never done this route before, didn't realize until it was too late to pull up that they were careening right towards one of the volcanoes, the high peaks, of the continent and 297 or 257 people never made it home. Sometimes a degree is all it takes to create consequences that we can't even begin to imagine. Now, as we start in a new year, that sounds like a somber tone. And what could any of that have to do with these magi, these wise men, these people from the East? Well, actually, it has quite a bit to do with them. You see, one of the questions that really jumped off of the page and out of the story for me this year was the question of the star. I've never actually thought about the science of the moving star, but for some reason, the word stopped, caught my attention. The Magi are following the star that rose a star in the east. And they go and they have a conversation after months and years of study and focus and traveling and focus and, and they take their eyes off the star and they speak to the star of the world in that area, King Herod. And when they speak to King Herod, they ask about where the new king is. And anybody that knows anything about Herod and wise men would have known about Herod, 
knows that he is a power-hungry, blood-thirsty, crazy killer of anything that gets in his way. He's driven by his need to control all that is around him to the point that he would kill his own children if they stepped up too far. So to ask the question, where is the new king, simply because he's the ruler in this capital area, seems like an error of judgment on the wise men's part, does it not? How often do we take our eyes off of the focus of the guiding light of God and get drawn in and attracted to that which is worldly only to find out that a relational moment, a conversation, a word spoken with a stranger, an action creates a course that can become deadly. Now maybe it doesn't actually end in death, maybe it ends in somebody who doesn't come back to church. Maybe it ends in somebody who says that God thing cannot be true because if that's what a Christian looks like, or maybe it's just a relationship that begins to become frostbitten and then icy and then it feels impenetrable to find our way back to one another in Christian love. The the Magi ask a question and Herod is the one who puts it together. They simply say, where's the new king? Herod is the one who goes to his advisors and says, the Christ is born where? Because Herod has a piece of the puzzle and the Magi have another piece of the puzzle and the advisors who study scripture, those legal experts, have a third piece of the puzzle. It's the when, it's the where, and it's the who. And all of these different pieces are coming together just like the president and the laser pointers and the discovery of fun in the streets below. Nobody could have anticipated how it was all going to happen. Maybe the wise men didn't make an error in judgment. Maybe it was just one of those moments that only hindsight could show to be a mistake. Maybe it wasn't a miscalculation at all. But what about that crazy star? Because if the star stops, well, then logic would dictate that that means the star was moving the whole time. So they, they had to take their eyes off of a moving star and focus on what was happening down here on Earth, right? Well, that's the question that led me to doing some research. And I found some information by an astronomer, and he was talking about how these different phrases, the star that rises in the east and the fact that the star actually stopped or stood still, depending upon which translation you read. Uh, He was talking about how those actually mean something in the ancient world. You know how we have idiomatic expressions? Well, the star in the east, the star rising in the east, did not literally mean that there was a star that came up and moved, like taillights that we follow on our way to a party. The star in the east was a very certain phenomenon because stars are fixed points. They do not move in the sky. We see different stars because the earth rotates. We see different stars because the earth revolves around the sun, but stars do not move. The only things that move in the nighttime sky are planets. And the different planets move in different speeds because they're in different orbits around the sun. We're one of those planets, which means that we are looking at these planets that are moving around the sun from a very relativistic point of view. Yeah, he lost me too, and I've got some sort of science background. But the star rising in the east was a term for a planet that had not been visible in the nighttime sky for a while because that particular planet, if this is the sun, had managed to get into its area of orbit where Earth, sun, planet, we weren't gonna see it. It was hidden in the daytime. Too brilliant a star to be seen from afar. That sun hid the star, the planet. And so the rising of the star is the one moment when a planet comes out of that part of the orbit and you see it 
just as the sun begins to rise. You have to be intentionally looking for this moment. It's not gonna be a star that you're accidentally gonna see at some point in the night because it's so brilliant and bright. It is a glimpse that you catch with intentionality and focus in the Magi. These scientists of their time, the astrologers and astronomers of their time, they were looking for the star that rose in the east. They were looking for that glimpse alongside trying to figure out where the sun was in which constellation of which zodiac. And I know that astrology and Christianity can go in two different directions, but again, this was the science of their time. And they paid attention to all of the signs and it told them when the child when the new king was to be born. And then they headed in the direction. It wasn't a star that was constantly showing them the way. It was a star that rose, and then a star that stopped. The stopping of a star, the stopping of a planet happens when Earth and the orbit of the other planet happen to pass each other. So if this one is rotating or revolving and this one is revolving, once we pass, Instead of looking like the star is moving, now the star is standing still. So between the signs of a star that rises right before sunrise, a planet that shows up, and between the signs of two planets that pass in orbit, and between the signs of the sun and the moon being somewhere in the sky at a certain time, those who knew nothing about the living Lord knew that something important was happening. They had that piece of the puzzle and they headed in the direction of where it was happening. And then you've got Bethlehem and the legal experts and then you've got Herod. I wonder, it wasn't so much that they took their eyes off the star. It wasn't so much that they took their focus off of the horizon as it was they weren't quite sure the next step to take. And when we're not sure of the next step to take and we don't know the Lord, we tend to lean into the structures of power and the systems of power that are in place. And so the Magi did exactly what any wise person would do. They went to the king and they asked the question. We never tend to read about the massacre of the infants We tend to gloss over that, it's too close to Christmas. We don't wanna think about a bunch of two-year-old and under babies, boys being killed. But because they leaned into that system of power, because they asked that one question, there were so many tears that were shed over the next few days and months and years. And the Christ child who would have been a toddler at this time, was taken in as a refugee in the land of Egypt, ironically, the place where the ancient people had come from, the place where Moses had escaped from its own infant massacre all those many, many millennia ago from Pharaoh who killed all the Hebrew babies to and under. So maybe it wasn't a mistake. Maybe it wasn't a mathematical error. Maybe it wasn't about degrees after all. Maybe it was simply about people being people. Don't we do that from time to time when we get caught up in moments of fear, in moments of anxiety, in moments where we feel our safety and security is being threatened? Don't we find that in those moments, we will lean into whatever the systems are that we feel will keep us safe, and we forget that there's something greater that has been guiding us all along? Even just this past week, I had a conversation with a mentor and friend who reminded me that as the new year starts and as things continue, to change, that I've got to keep my eyes on a kingdom that is real and on a God who never changes. Even those who are pastors have to be reminded that there is a guiding light that is greater than anything on this earth. And we can continue to lean into military power, we can continue to lean into whatever kind of social power we've got, 
We can continue to lean into popularity because it makes us feel safe in the jungle that is middle school or high school. We can continue to lean into economic power. We can do those things innocently, maybe not even intentionally. The fact is there are still children who work in sweatshops because we're trying to save a few dollars on the other side of the world. There are still children who look like skeletons because for some reason there's not enough food to go around. There are still infants that are paying for relational decisions that are made, even if they're made with no intention of ill will. So as we begin this year, the question is what light are we following? What voice are we listening to and for? What is our goal? Because whichever star we follow, that will be the place that we arrive. And there is no, it's never too late. It's never too late to change direction. With every breath we take, we can lean in to God. And so may the God of grace, may the God of hope, may the God of peace, may the God of love, may the God of, dare we say it, joy, all of that that we talked about at Christmas, may that fill you here and now with whatever your resolution is, whatever my resolution is, so that we move forward from this epiphany moment into what will be the rest of this year with a guiding light that continues to allow us to live Christmas as if it's every single day. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, when you created us and you gave us the ability to choose, you knew that we weren't going to be able to handle it that we were too small in mind, too small in spirit, too small in our own physical bodies to be able to understand the consequences of good and evil. And yet you created us and you loved us and you give us chance after chance and you came to be among us. And so right here and right now, God, as we hear of the the ones who sought you and who found you, as we're reminded that the wise people still seek you today, we pray that you would give us all that we need so that we can continue to learn about success even from those moments of mistake, so that we can continue to seek forgiveness rather than leaning into guilt, so that we can continue to offer and build goodness and new life and your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, instead of leaving consequences of tragedy in our wake. Help us to intentionally follow you, and may we shine your light in the lives of others. In the name of the three in one we pray, amen.